Heritage. It's a very important part of any college or university in America, but perhaps even more so at Marist College, because it is our heritage that we have built upon, and we attribute much of the success that we have enjoyed in recent years to that heritage that has been given to us by our founders. Today we are very fortunate to have with us the two individuals who have helped laid the foundation for Marist College, two individuals that have done more than any others to contribute to the numerous successes that the college is enjoying today. We're honored to have with us Brother Paul Ambrose, the founding president of Marist College, and Jack Gartland, a life trustee, a former chairman of the board of trustees, and an individual who has contributed more in many different ways than any individual to the successes that the college has enjoyed. We hope to, through these interviews, capture their sense of the history and heritage of Marist College so that we can save these thoughts and recollections for future generations. Conducting the interview today with Brother Paul and Jack will be Tony Sonera, our Vice President for College Advancement. Tony is a graduate of Marist College's Marist Schools and uh, knows well the history that we have enjoyed here at our institution. We hope you enjoy hearing and watching this tape and learning a little bit about the history of Marist College from the perspective of individuals that have helped contribute to its success. the celebration of the Marist Centenary, celebrating 100 years of Marist Brothers' service in the United States of America. Brother Paul Ambrose, one of the leading Marist Brothers in the United States, will tell us a little bit about that convocation in a few minutes. But I would like to ask him to help us to understand better what a Marist Brother is and what kind of work the Marist Brothers are doing around the United States and throughout the world. Brother Paul? Well, T Tony, we're an, an order of teaching brothers. Somebody said once to the brothers, what, well, what is a brother? And uh, for want of a better answer, he said, well, he's a female nun. <laughs> but that's not why we become brothers. <clears throat> we. Our founder started the order of the Marist Brothers because of the number of kids in France who are without education. The La Salle Brothers, who are expert educators, started 100 years before we did. But they were taking the children of the city schools, the big schools, and the farming schools, the village schools, there were none. Our founder felt pity for these poor kids, abandoned kids, and he said, I want brothers to imitate the LaSalle brothers in the teaching methods, but to maybe have lower tuition costs and operate a little bit more economically, and we'll be like a family. Brothers will live together, and that's how it all started. It started in France in 1817 with two candidates. And now we are over 7,000 Marist brothers in 846 schools in 72 countries of the world. Mm. <clears throat> and one of his fortes, one of his strong points was to go to the poor. And as the Jesuit were dedicated to Jesus, the Christ, he wanted his brothers to be known as the brothers, the little brothers of Mary the Marist brothers. 
And it's part of our charism to spread devotion to Our Lady because there's no one who served Christ as well as Mary. So we try to imitate Mary in our service of Christ for the poor. And because the poor are not just here around us, another part of his charism was to go forth in any and every country of the world where we could find poor children needing education. And his great saying was, every diocese of the world falls under our jurisdiction because there are needs everywhere. And that is why we have spread so rapidly uh, all over the globe. Well, now, you've been a Marist brother for <clears throat> almost 57 years. Is that right? Correct, yes. Could you tell us how that first inspiration or calling came to you when you were a young lad? Well, I, uh, it was an inspiration, of course. I was very young. I had never seen a brother in my life. I went to school to the sisters. And uh, I was in the seventh grade. And this gentleman come over, dressed up the way I am, to speak to us about the need of brothers. And he was looking for brothers. Well, I was an altar boy, and I wanted to become a priest. It was all decided that I would become a priest. But after listening to his talk of what the brothers were, what they did, the work for the poor, work, dedicate your life to youth, <clears throat> To spread devotion to Our Lady, which had been inculcated in us in my family from birth, and to go to the missions and not to be afraid to be sent as Christ sent the apostles to go out. And he told us where, where the brothers worked. This, there was a, a certain sensation that came over me. I said, this is it. I went to see him. I was ready to join at once. And he told me, he said, the, no, you will need permission from your parents. He said, I'll be here tomorrow. Ask them tonight. I went home, and my dad wouldn't hear of it. You're too young. You don't know what you're doing. My mother said, if this is what you want to do, you always want to become a priest. What happened? I said, well, I don't know, but this is it. She says, well, if this is it, this is what you want to do, I'm for it. So I asked my dad, are you against my going? He said, I won't be against it, but I'm not encouraging you. I went back and I told the brother the next day that I'm ready to go at once, 13 years old, in the seventh grade, ready to go. He said, he had taken my statistics, and he said, I'll let you know when there's room. There's no room now. <laughs> he sent me a picture postcard for my birthday, August 28th, and on the picture, in back of the picture postcard, it was marked, happy birthday, we have room, come. <laughs> I went the following Sunday, September 1st. My father wouldn't say goodbye to me. I had to go to my aunt's where he was, he didn't want to be around the house when I left. I went to find him to kiss him goodbye. He didn't come. I left. We were five new candidates that day. Four of them left within the first couple of months, mm -hmm. and I'm still here. You're still here. Very good. Yeah. Now, when you left home and you joined the brothers, where did you go? To Tingsboro, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And then did you Tingsboro ever... had just been built in 1924. The first year of uh, its operation was 1925. I entered September 1st, 1926. 26. And did you ever <coughs> study here in Poughkeepsie? Oh, yes. I studied there for two years in Tingsboro, and I came here in 1928 in Poughkeepsie uh -huh. to complete the high school. We, to, for the high school, we had started the high school in Tingsboro and completed it here. And because of a shortage of brothers at the time, um, a group of us were taken from the larger group and sent home on vacation, and we were sent to our novitiate a little bit early, a year or two in advance. Mm -hmm. And I was in that group. And I went to the novitiate in 1930 to become a brother. I received this religious habit on June, July 26, 1930. Feast of St. Anne, right? Feast of St. Anne. This used to be called St. Anne's Hermitage. I remember The that. old building, you remember that. <clears throat> St. Anne's Hermitage. Our brothers first came here in 1906. The brothers were connected with Canada. We started in the United States in 1886. 
and uh, in Lewiston, Maine. And then 1890 in Manchester, New Hampshire. In 1892 in Lowell, Mass, Lawrence, Mass, New York City. We had two schools in New York City, St. Ed's Academy and St. Agnes. And it, it developed. But we belonged to <clears throat> the Canadian United States province. And we needed, we were getting candidates, sending them to Canada, to Canada for training. So we decided to buy this McPherson estate, I think it was. That's correct. The, yeah. And we bought this old big property, which became a junior rate, a training for young candidates. Hmm. I was here in 28. Then we had our own novitiate, where the McCann Center is now, and went through the novitiate training. And where the Fontaine building and the chapel is, is where the Scholasticate was. And this is where <clears throat> we started the, the, we did our post-novitiate training, our first college training. We had a two-year training college called the Maris Normal Training School. And this Normal Training School was affiliated with Fordham University. And automatically, all the brothers when they left this training school, they were assigned to teach in the various schools, whether it was New England or New York or wherever. And they had to finish their degrees on their own. Hmm. Those in New York would go to evening classes, and all of them took courses all summer long, and all of them took courses, those who were in New York took courses on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. I finished my degree by evening classes and Saturday classes and summer work. And this is how all the brothers at the normal training school. Now, Jack, around the time that uh, Brother Paul was uh, <coughs> getting involved with the Maris brothers, you were a young boy here in Poughkeepsie. Did you have any contact with the Maris brothers uh, in your <coughs> early days? Yes, because uh, I was born and raised in Poughkeepsie. Right. And uh, I went through St. Mary's Grammar School and the first Catholic high school in the city of Poughkeepsie was started by the Maris Brothers down at St. Peter's Church. And they had the upper floor, I think it was, of the St. Peter's Boys Grammar School. And so my parents sent me there. And that must have been in the fall of 1927. Hmm. I stayed there for two years, and then I switched to Poughkeepsie High School. So I knew who the brothers were. I knew they were Maris Brothers. Mm -hmm. I knew they had an officiate up here. And Gosh, when you mentioned uh, St. Anne's Hermitage, the, the uh, building that was out here in front where the Lowell Thomas, right where this building is here now, and um, that was the novitiate. Is that right, Paul? The junior rate. Junior rate. And provincial house. And provincial house. Headquarters of our provincial Later house. Later on, when, they, uh, when this house really became obsolete, I remember uh, the Marist brothers asked permission to tear it down, and the fire department said, hey, we'd like to uh, run an experiment up there. And they got all the fire companies from locally around here to come up, and they burned it down. Right. And they had all the fire companies uh, uh, all you know, going one against the other, yeah. all over wow. the place like huh. that. They were running crazy because I happened to go up here as a spectator at the time, wow. and that's why I remember it so well. Huh. Uh, the uh, it was quite interesting because the the uh, fire departments claimed they got a lot of training out of it for a lot of their the volunteer that's men right. and all. Okay. Were you here then, Paul? No, uh, twenty eight. I came here. Yeah. I Twenty-eight. Was, uh, Twenty-seven. I was, I, was, I was out out of the place when the building was burnt. Oh. I was in a nihilist took care of it. Uh -huh. but we well, had that was after he came, yeah. I guess, yes. <clears throat> after nihilist came. <laughs> but on the St. Peter's bit, uh, uh, your St. Peter's High School, the brothers lived on campus here, mm -hmm. and they went to teach at St. Peter's. And that little building that is still exists called St. Peter's, that was their residence. Wow. And there was a wooden addition to it that was where Brother Tarsicius started the printing in the cellar of that wooden mm -hmm. addition. And he was printer for the college in 50 years at least, if not more. But that addition, wooden addition, was removed 
and what is now office building and that little St. Peter's was the original residence of the brothers who were teaching at St. Peter's High School. One of the things I discovered last <coughs> summer when uh, the brothers were here for the convocation was that my uh, freshman homeroom teacher, religion teacher and geometry teacher at Mount St. Michael, Brother Joseph Damien, had also been Jack's teacher in 1927. In geometry uh, so, um, also. We had uh, a connection there that I wasn't aware of. Uh. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, I think probably the fact that the Marys Brothers had started St. Peter's High School in the city of Poughkeepsie is what started the agitation among a lot of local people to uh, when Maris, or we called Marion College at first, you remember, when they first got their charter, uh, started local people agitating about sending young men up here as commuter students. Uh -huh. And that started, oh, that went on for three, four years before Brother Paul finally got involved in it. Well, we want to get to that point because that'll be an interesting part <laughs> of our history. But let's take a few steps back and tell us, Brother Paul, about the time around 1943. I think that's when you came back uh, to the college in some official capacity. Yes. But let, if you allow, let me go further back. Okay. That's something that will tear your hearts out. When our brothers wanted to buy this property, and also the Beck estate, the Novitiate property, we got this for a very reasonable mm -hmm. price. They were, they were offered from North Road all the way up to Violet Avenue for an extra $15,000 they could have had all the way up to Violet Avenue. And they asked our superiors in, in uh, France at the time if it was okay to buy this. And they said, well, you have a big property right on the Hudson. Why do you need so much? It's going to deprive people of this. No, we didn't get the permission. But looking back now, you wouldn't have Marist East or West. You would have the whole works, you see. But the, at that time, it was offered to us. I'm just not able to do it then. Not a, not, not, well, we were advised not to, that we, we, it would have been looked upon maybe by the people as being gluttons, taking over everything. You remember that the <coughs> Jesuit had properties way back also. That's what the Jesuits had around 900 acres yeah, up there and they, in they St. Sold, Andrews. You see. They went all the way to Violet <coughs> Avenue. Yeah, huh? that's right. And, we, and have, then, we, we had the same offer. And all that property that Brother Paul is talking about later was purchased by Fairview Improvement Company. And all the development of a fair view is all that wow. old Beck property. Huh. Good. Well, they purchased a fair view improvement company was formed <coughs> by the Knauss and the Schatz families here. Hmm. That's right. And they developed that starting at around 1911 or sometime like that. At one time, I was president of Fairview Improvement Company. That's how I know about it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Well, Paul, take yeah. us back to 1943 now. Yes. I'll take you back to 1941. You know, when I, I left here and, <clears throat> and I taught in the grammar school in Manchester and in Lowell, and I went to New York from 37 to 41 in high school. And my career as a teacher ended in 1941. Wow. I got the degree from Fordham, Summers. I got a degree from Villanova University in library science, Summers. And I went to CU for two years to get my degree in, from CU in English literature. And I remember to this day that uh, I got a phone call from the provincial in Washington, D.C., where I was the director of a community of four brothers <coughs> studying. And uh, we were living in the building of the <coughs> former ambassador to China, Mr. Johnson. <coughs> And uh, that is the house we had purchased. And the provincial told me, when in the world are you going to finish your degree? This was in the beginning of August. I said, I just got word this morning that everything is finished, mm -hmm. that I'll get it, the degree at the convocation or uh, in September or whatever it was, but that, that everything was finished, that I was guaranteed, that everything had been accepted. He told me, take the next train to Poughkeepsie. That was 1943. I says, the next train to Poughkeepsie leaves at 12. This was 9 o'clock in the morning. He says, be on it. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of time to pack, huh? The, well, that was the system in those days. So I came up to Poughkeepsie, <clears throat> come up from New York, from Washington to New York, and the New York train to Poughkeepsie Station, come over here to see the provincial. 
And I said, what gives? He says, it's good to see you here. Congratulations. You must be tired. Go to bed. I'll see you in the morning. So in the morning after mass, he calls me in. And he said, uh, I want you to go to the scholasticate where the brothers, the young brothers, were going through these two years of normal training school and stay there for a, a week with the brother who's there now. And at the end of the week, you take over. Hmm. And there were close to 100 young brothers, students, <clears throat> going through this first two years of college. And he said, but that's not all. He said, we're putting all our men through the same routine. He says, I don't mind everybody getting an education, degree in education, but some want to be specialists in other fields. He says, I'd like you to work at making this a four-year college. Hmm. And this associated from Fordham University. So we won't all be Fordham graduates. Now, this was in the beginning of August. I was 29 years old. I became 30 years old on the 28th of August. And this was dumped into my lap then. I says, you don't know what you're asking me. Oh, he says, I think I do. He says, a lot of work. And I says, well, I'm going to need a lot of help. He says, you'll get the help. I says, you're going to have to bring in teachers. We'll bring them. It's going to take money. Well, we haven't got too much, but he says, whatever we have, we'll dedicate to it. And it'll take time, but get it. And that was how I was commissioned mm -hmm. to, to work at making normal training school into a college. <clears throat> there was no question of the name at the time. It was, we weren't worried about a name. There was, yeah. well, what do we do next, you know? And I believe that what helped me tremendously, and I wish to give credit where it's due, I had been pretty much taken up at CU with the setup at CU, and registrar, and um, uh, the man in charge there was Dr. Roy J. De Ferrari. And I became very friendly with him while at CU as the superior of the Maris brothers at that time. So I hightailed it back by train to see you to see an appointment with Dr. De Ferrari. And I says, here's what the mandate that I have. He says, good, brother. I said, I'm going to need some help. I said, we are affiliated for them. Is there a possibility of our first being affiliated, also being affiliated with Catholic University? I thought that was an initial step that we should go, go through. So I got him to come over here to see what we're doing and to help me with the plan for the, the ex extra year. The provincial had told me, we'll leave the men here three years and three summers, and they should be able to do four years' work at that time. That was the, f the frame schedule that he had given us. Dr. De Ferrari agreed that it could be possible. We planned the courses, and we were first affiliated with Catholic, un with Catholic University. And then he says, you should make your move to the University of the State of New York. I said, OK, I'll go to Albany. But I said, uh, I need your help. Who do I contact in Albany? Oh, he said, there's a friend of mine there working on the, he's in charge of graduate schools and so on. He says, go see Dr. J. Hillis Miller. So my next trip was in Albany. And um, saw Dr. Miller, explained the situation, mentioned Dr. De Ferrari, and that gave me an in immediately. We got Dr. Miller interested in what we're doing, and I explained to him that there is no college uh, facilities between Catholic, between Fordham Universities and Loudonville Siena College. And I said, this would be a Catholic college for the, for the brothers Eventually, it was the intention, eventually, to open it to outsiders. Well, he got very interested in this work. He came down to make two or three visits and inspections and make all kinds of suggestions. But one time when he came, I surprised him, and I surprised Dr. De Ferrari. I invited Dr. De Ferrari to come for a visit. I invited Dr. But I didn't tell him that they were going to meet. Oh, nice. They hadn't met in a long time. 
for a long time <coughs> met. They got very much interested, and I believe that they adopted the idea of the brothers having their own college. Hmm. And CU was backing us up. We had our affiliation with CU, and Dr. J. Hillis Miller went to bat with us with the, the powers. This, these transactions went on from 1943 to 1946. Hmm. And then in 1946, what happened? In 1946, the Board of Trustees of the University of the State of New York approved Marist College and sent us uh, what they call a temporary charter. Mm -hmm. A temporary charter, and uh, that kind of gave me a blow, a temporary charter. I says, we want the real thing. He says, well, everybody goes through the same system. You have the charter. It was dated September 20th, 1946. I remember the date because I sent a telegram. We had a convocation in Rome at that time of brothers from all over the world. 167 brothers from all over the world, and they were studying, you know, the growth of the order and so on. I sent a telegram to the new general. Marist College has its approval as a college, normal training school as a college. And uh, they, they all celebrated and they all cheered and the news went out worldwide from our center in France to the, to, to the people. But I got back to, to Dr. Miller and I said, hey, why the temporary? He said, this is normal. He said, you have five years in which to qualify for a permanent charter. And uh, in the recommendations which they had about additional staff, lay staff, bringing in outsiders and so on, board of trustees, everything was there. We started at once to implement <clears throat> And we got the permanent charter. Now, there is a point that I contest here. I may be wrong, mm -hmm. and I think somebody should look in on it. We received the information that the Board of Trustees of the University of State of New York had approved Marist College permanent charter on December 15th, 1950. In other words, we didn't need the five years. They approved us then. And uh, several times now I've seen that the date is uh, December 19th. It could very well be that the, that, the, uh, that the secretarial work of the University of the State of New York sent us a document on the 19th. But we were approved. I'm, I, I would like that to be traced. Right, well, on we'll December 15th <clears throat> is when we got the notification mm -hmm. after, the, after their, their session of that, that meeting, Dr. Miller called me to tell me at once. That's how okay. close we were. Wow. So that is a, a little point to be clarified, I believe. But was it, was it uh, incorporated by the Board of Regents as Marion College or Marist College? As Marion College. Marion College. We, we had decided, we had, we had bantered back and forth. There were Marist fathers at a college in, in Washington, D.C. There was a couple of Marist college. There was also a Marion college out in West for girls. Yes. And uh, the brothers were asked to vote, and they voted on Marion college because they really went through St. Anne's hermitage. And we're Marist brothers. St. Anne's was the day when we renewed our vows on July 26, every brother for years. So Mary and Anne was Marion College. Mm. So it was a blend of the two names. And this is how we were approved originally. It was after I left that Paul Stokes, to his, to his memory I say it, <clears throat> and a hard worker, dedicated to the college, that he, they pushed to change the Marist College. Oh. At the time, they, they changed the college colors they were blue and gold to red and white, and they changed the mascot to the fox. The red fox. So, red oh. fox you see. That was all changed <laughs> at that time. And uh, the request for the chain name change was approved very easily. Mm -hmm. Paul, on uh, May 23rd, 11 days from now, the college will hold its uh, 41st commencement, and over 700 uh, men and women will uh, walk across the, uh, the stage and receive their degree from the president of the college. Tell us about the first commencement. You won't believe it. 
We graduated <clears throat> brothers. They were all brothers, of course. It was only later we had agreed the first graduate, first class of lay people consisted of 10, then 26 in the mm -hmm. just group. But the, the brothers, the first graduating class naturally had to be after the date of the charter. Mm -hmm. Even though the charter was only a temporary charter, we were authorized <clears throat> to grant degrees to have the college course. The, the, the charter, um, I saw someplace that we got the, the, co the college approved in order to take lay people. Well, that would be wrong. We just asked to get the college approved as a college for brothers. Eventually, <laughs> we were to take people. But we, the, the charter authorized us at once to grant degrees to the brothers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we already had the permission to extend it to, to, to grow. The first graduating class was a class of four brothers. And it was held during the summer. They had finished their courses during the summer. We had no parchment. We had no diplomas. We were having the diplomas engraved. And uh, we had just received the, the, the approval. We had the diplomas, a, a quantity engraved. They were not ready yet. We had a ceremony out uh, of next to Greystone where there are a lot of trees. Mm -hmm. There's that little Japanese maple tree that we stole from our property in Isopus to plant there. I planted it when it was <laughs> about one foot high, and it's <coughs> now a beautiful tree. We used to have a stone table and benches that Brother Nihilus made. We used to have our Sunday evening d suppers out there. Well, we had the graduation class out there. We had the graduation there. And we cheered these four brothers who had completed their work. And we had a supper in their, we had a supper in their honor. They were assigned that same night. They were told where they would go out teaching. And they would be sent their diplomas in the various communities huh. where they were. And they were promised to have another celebration locally with the brothers where they went. Huh. But uh, I felt very badly that we couldn't do anything more for them. But I had arranged that right after the supper, and we, this was about five or six, five o'clock, I put the four of them in the station wagon with, that we had with me, and I drove them to Torrington in Connecticut. Connecticut. And we, we, we went there for a nice ride, and they were having a lot of fun talking about their assignments. And it was an occasion for them to be alone with me. And we went out for banana splits, and we had a drink, and we came back, and that was it. Okay. That was the first graduating class. Uh -huh. And these four brothers, and for the record, I mentioned their name, Brother Bernard Frederick Toomey. See, the alphabetical order went by your brother's name in those days. Brother Christopher Emil Connolly. Brother John Benedict Normandin. These three left the brotherhood after. Mm -hmm. Brother Patrick Eugene McGee. Oh, Pat McGee? <laughs> Pat McGee was, the, he holds diploma number four. Huh. And it, in the celebration of our centenary, of work in America, the college very graciously awarded Brother Patrick McGee an honorary doctorate. Yes, I remember that. He has been an exceptional person, <clears throat> educated, dedicated to all the schools and the hard work, and he's been the counselor, he's been the, the secretary of the provincial council for years. Hmm. And was a director of Mount St. Michael when I was a student there, so Brother Patrick and I go back <laughs> a long way together. I want to move up in history a little bit. Uh, the permanent charter uh, happened in 1950, and you had in the back of your mind, even years before that, the idea of eventually bringing lay students, lay students. Uh, to the college. <coughs> I think the gentleman to your left uh, played a key role in helping the college to get ready um, to deal with the question of bringing lay students in. Uh, Jack, uh, tell us about uh, your first involvement with Marist College. <coughs> well, I can remember reading in the papers uh, that local parents were agitating the brothers up there to take some lay students in. And uh, Brother Paul here gave a couple of press releases saying that eventually 
they probably would. But Brother Paul and I were the only two men on the board of trustees of the St. Francis Hospital School of Nursing. Mm -hmm. And there were either four or five women on that board. And I can remember, I think it was in the spring of 56, although I'm not sure was a spring or, or fall, but we were at a meeting up here at the hospital, <clears throat> and these women were, were talking like mad for a long, long time on things that had nothing to do with the school of nursing, you know. And so I turned to Paul, because we were sitting next to each other, and I said, you know, these women are cutting into my cocktail hour. And I said, I think we better get out of here. So he says, I'll go with you. <laughs> so we excused ourselves, and, and uh, he said to me, come on over to my quarters. He lived in Adrian at that time, right. do you remember? He's come on over there, he said, and I'll buy you a drink. I said, good. So I went over with him, and we had a scotch and water or something like that. And during the course of our conversation, he talked about bringing lay students in, and he said that there were no lay trustees on the, uh, on the board of trustees at that time. They were all brothers. And he said, I'd like to have some lay participation to give me some advice on how to handle lay students. He said, I wonder if you would help me get together a group of men that would help me out. Remember that, Paul? That's right. So um, we got fellows like, uh, remember Jack Mulvey was a lawyer here in town, and Dick Small across the street was president of Western Printing, and we got George Whalen from Millbrook, hmm. and Nate Reifler, who was a local businessman. He was head of an electric supply company, and he was a great friend of Nihilus's That's at right. the time. That's right. <clears throat> and we got Jim Dwyer, who was a, a banker up in Kingston. I don't know, maybe I missed some, but... Mm -hmm. uh, so we got them together and had a meeting. And uh, I can remember Paul sat next to me, I sat next to, to him, and uh, he turned to me and he said, Jack, we well, should have a chairman. And I said, yes. And I turned to Nate Reifer and I said, Nate, you make a good chairman. He said, oh, no, no, I don't want to do that. And we went around a room and finally came back to me. So Paul says, you're it. You're good. <laughs> so I was chairman of his lay advisory board, I think mm -hmm. we called it, or something like that. And we started making plans for the admission of some lay students. Mm -hmm. And it was quite interesting. <clears throat> Paul Stokes, at that time, uh, was here. And I think he was made uh, dean of discipline or dean something. Dean of discipline, that's right. And uh, he was scared to death of lay students. He said, I can handle the brothers. I don't know what I can do about these lay students <laughs> because they were going to come in cars, you know, and everything like that. And he didn't know uh, there were not any parking lots up here, and he didn't know quite how he was going to handle it. But, uh, uh, gee, I miss Paul, you know. Uh, uh, but the uh, Nihilus was very active at that time. <clears throat> the Nihilus, uh, Nihilus Donnelly, that's who the Donnelly Hall is named after. When Nihilus, went around town and he picked up anything he possibly could. Bulldozers, cranes, anything that he could use in building. <clears throat> and previous to that, while they were putting buildings up here, the brothers themselves did a lot of the physical work. And during the summertime, the brothers from all over, the, probably the novices anyway, were all asked to come here and pitch in on building. And I just, I always remember uh, knowing that the help was not expert, mm -hmm. contract expert builders and all. If a wall would call for, say, uh, 12 inches or 18 inches, he made a 36 inches wide. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> and to be on the safe in side. In Fontaine right? Building, as an example, where the library is now, that used to be <clears throat> the residence for the brothers. In the dining room. When the dining room was there and everything. and, and uh, when later on it was to be converted into library, the contractor that had the job, he had to dig, put new doors in and new windows, and he had to dig through some of these walls. And one day he said to me, I don't understand how the heck these things were built. He says, here's a non-bearing wall, and it's three feet thick. <laughs> of course, concrete was cheap in those days, yeah, you know, and they, they used a lot of concrete in those buildings. Uh -huh. So one time we asked Nihilus about it, and he said, well, we always want to make sure that it would be substantial, and the building would stand there for a while. Because he said, none of these brothers were experts at, mm -hmm. at masons or carpenters and like that. But they, uh, they certainly did a lot of work around here. 
And uh, in any event, finally, that was in 1956. And I've forgotten, was it 456 or 457 that uh, the first lake students came? 56. <laughs> 56, was it? And I do remember that Paul had the idea of only admitting 20 at a time. And I think the first time he had like 100 applications for 20 positions in the college. Hmm. And uh, it kept growing like that, and it just never stopped. And our lay advisory board was in existence, and we met, oh gosh, uh, at Paul Call, but we met practically uh, every month for maybe 10 years or something like that. <coughs> I do remember one interesting thing uh, shortly after that. One day, Paul called me up and he said, can you come up for lunch? And I said, sure. <clears throat> he said, I want you to meet a young brother. Uh, he said he's just completing his work for a PhD in mathematics down at New York University. And he said, I'd like to have you meet him. His name is Brother Linus Richard. And I came up to meet him. And just before that, Paul said to me, he said, he's a nice young man and you're going to like him. And we just selected him to be the new president of college because I'm going to leave here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to Rome. He said, I'm going to be one of the generals uh, of the order in Rome. But he said, don't tell anybody because it isn't public yet. Besides that, don't congratulate Linus Richard because he, he, he said he doesn't know anything about it yet. <laughs> and I haven't even talked to him about it yet. <clears throat> so I sat there during the whole lunch, and I kept looking at this young man, and I kept saying, see, he looks pretty good, looks pretty good. I couldn't dare, I didn't say a word, you know, I didn't dare say a word, because I was afraid that I'd say, gee, congratulations, you know, or something, and, and uh, remember that day, Paul? That's right. <laughs> Paul, maybe you could it, recount it, a little bit for us, uh, what <clears throat> happened? How did you get called to Rome, and did that come as a surprise when that happened? No, completely by surprise, completely. But... Um, you see, um, I, I'd like to pay tribute to before I go into this, and I'll glad, do so gladly. When, when the Board of Trustees, when the, the Board of Regents gave us some advice and suggestions and parameters to follow, it was the, to bring in the Board of Trustees, mm -hmm. which were Jack, we did. It was to put up more buildings. Mm -hmm. It was to bring in lay teachers, bring in lay teachers. And at that time, we... We needed help. I needed professional help. So we, we hired Dr. Schroeder. That's right. And then we got people to come, like George Summers, who's still here. He came, uh, well, he came to teach part-time from Manhattan hmm. with uh, Joe Morano, or came also at that time. And we had a number who, we got some of our brothers with their doctor. As soon as a brother got a doctorate, he'd be brought up here. And I, I, I have to say that when there's a question of getting brothers up here, number from any community or any school, when, I, when the college in this infancy asked for these people, I was never refused. Hmm. Any money that I asked, we got it. Hmm. There was never any question of what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. They had complete confidence in Nihilus's work, and my, Nihilus and I worked together. And, uh, you know, uh, I sit here and as, the, as the first president, which I was, but the credit is not mine. The credit is teamwork, family work. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> if you look carefully on the archives, you're going to find out that I'm not, my name is not down as president. No? No. Uh, in, the, in the first years, when we first got this charter, I was the master of scholastics. I'm the, that was my title then. Mm -hmm. I organized the college and so on. But the provincial and his five councillors were the board of trustees. So for, for the, on the place on the forms for the name of the president of the college, we put the provincial's name. And board of trustees, the others, the others. 
And the provincial changed every three years. Well, there was a new name there and a new name there. I kept sending these reports in. Mm -hmm. But they never even came here. They were never here. <laughs> they, they had nothing to do with it, you know. You see. So it might lead to confusion, you know, to say, well, we have a lot of names of the first presidents. And it, they might mention my brother Linus Williams. That uh, he's still living, but I mean, he he was provincial, but uh -huh. uh, he endorsed everything I did. And Brother Lewis Omer, the same thing. And Brother Kieran Thomas came after it. But uh, I really was the first president, and mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in, in 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 de, de facto, but not in on the list, not on the program, and nobody cared who was president or who did what. Everybody pitched in together, mm -hmm. you know. You know, and that, I had tremendous endorsement to help from everybody. In that regard, I do remember one time uh, you asked me to come up here because all the trustees, they were over in New York City, and they were going to come and look at Maris. And the whole group came here, and uh, you took them to lunch down to Nelson House, the old Nelson House down there. Right. But it was one little short brother who was only like, I bet he wasn't even five feet tall. Was he the treasurer or something at that time? Yes. Because Brother Mary talk, Andrew. That was his name. Brother Mary Andrew. So all he wanted to talk about were the finances. He was uh, in charge of the financial. You know? <laughs> he was in charge of the finances. He was scared. Of he was scared of the college. He really uh -huh. was uh, that it was going to flop. Yeah. And uh, I remember that's all I, we went to lunch down in Nelson House. And that's all he talked about was what would happen if this. You know. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he took, he did his homework. He, he got the plans and what, what we what we wanted. He went to see manufacturers trusts with his his buddies there, and then Merrill Lynch, and he, he checked everything out thoroughly. And then he, he gave me the go-ahead sign. I never was refused anything, hmm. you know. And, you know, you could, you could start out a fantastic thing like this and be blocked right and left. And uh, with, with Nihilus, for example, he was so busy that I'd, I'd see him rarely. But when I needed to see Nihilus, put an order at his door. If he needed something for me, put an order at my door. And it was understood. At once, we would go out to dinner. We'd go up to Hyde Park, and we'd have dinner. We'd talk over all the problems, all the plans, forthcoming. And that, that, that's how we operate. Now, what was Nihilus's role or uh, position? In Nihilus came here as a teacher of physics. But he had just put on this massive gymnasium in Lawrence, Massachusetts. The brothers put up the gymnasium in Lawrence, Massachusetts on their own. Now, this is 160 feet, 163 feet square. And it's a three-story building, hmm. the gymnasium and classes all the way around on the second floor. It is the largest hall in the whole city of Lawrence, and, which is used for bingo, for political rallies, for doctors' conventions, and for, to this day. Hmm. And this is built, as Jack said, cement three feet thick, solid. Nihilus had just finished there. So we got him over here because I knew the University of State of New York asked for new buildings. And uh, with Nihilus there, he, he was teaching here in the beginning and planning the buildings and working. And after one year, I said, well, this is ridiculous. We got somebody else to take his teaching, and he concentrated on the construction. So he became director of construction, construction. For, the, for the college. Yeah. and Yes. And tell us something, uh, uh, Jack alluded to this fact of a lot of the younger brothers helping in the building project. Is that what happened? Summers, the brothers came back and... <clears throat> the, the, the brothers, a, a project cannot go on just during the summers, mm -hmm. you see? So Nihilus would plan the project. And I told you I had, I always had at least 100 brothers. One year I had 146. I never had less than 100. During the 15 years that I was Master of Scholastics and President of the college. Well, Nihilus needed a group of 15 or 20. So I got the men together, got the brothers, and I said, now we need help to work, physical hard work. You're all going to be assigned a week, you know, or 10 days, or whatever it was. During that time, classes are going on. You are missing classes. Make sure that your buddies take the notes for you. You will be held responsible for everything that's going on in the classes. You won't be there, but you'll be held responsible. The term papers and everything. 
But I said, together we'll get these buildings put up and we, we will manage. The brothers accepted that. They, I could have had a riot. Mm -hmm. They accepted that. Nihilus would take his 10 men and they worked for him. You know, from 8 in the morning until 5 at night, then we'd come in and wash and clean up and shower, and then we'd have our prayers and dinner and so on, and then they'd scuffle about what they did, and the brothers, they'd be filling in. They'd stay up late to get some of their studies in, but the next 10 days would be another group. So Nihilus had people going continuously. So each brother had two or three times during a year when he had to lose uh, a week, 10 days of his studies and continue. During the holiday periods, Easter holidays and Christmas holidays, everybody would pitch in. Mm -hmm. During the summer holidays, we'd get some of our brothers from the various schools and we'd, we'd bring in 50 to 60, sometimes 75 brothers in the old novitiate with little brother Eddie Mike as their director. Brother Peter Ginnity, God rest his soul, had just passed away. Right. He was the cook for every summer for these men. Where did Brother Scotty fit in on that? Brother Scotty, he was, uh, he came in from Scotland and he was teaching in the school. He came in to work and he helped Nihilus with the equipment. Uh -huh. you see? And Brother Gus Landry, he was like clerk of the works. When Nihilus couldn't be there, Gus knew what the project had to be done and the brothers worked at it. And they loved to come for the summer. It was away from teaching. The brothers who were f f not finished their degrees would continue their summer work. But since the brothers were graduating from here, and those who graduated from here went on to get graduate work, but they were happy to come back here. And see, when you put up a house and it's your own, you're gonna take care of it. If you're living in a rented house, well, somebody else is heading. Sure. But the brothers come to this campus, and that's why we have to be very sensitive to tradition. And I appreciate what goes on here, this concern. Dennis's opening word, heritage. And there are not many colleges that are this concerned about heritage. But we have to be sensitive to this. The, the brothers started this, and they put their, their, their blood, sweat, and tears in this, the hard work, and they loved it. And they loved, they loved to come back, you know, and psychologically when we could not continue, we couldn't afford to continue because we, we, we didn't have the contacts with the foundation and we needed to pass this on to the Labor Board of Trustees and it was passed on at very reasonable terms to the, Labor, to the Board of Trustees and with no longer the brothers' ownership. This grasp the brothers to the core. Many of them did not understand. Yes. Why are we giving up? You know? Because they had worked so hard. Sure. And we were in a very difficult position, the superiors, where you try to explain to them that we're not giving up. Our work is continuing. It's carried on because we cannot physically do. So we don't have any more 100 brothers coming in for studies and so on. It's a new era and we have to adapt. They realize it and last summer, when these 350 brothers came here to spend this four day convention here, and it brought them all together, it brought them back to their roots. This, this did more to smooth that difficult feeling than anything else because they saw what the college is all about where it's moving, the direction it's moving. They were so well treated, they were so proud of everything. Because there were a few things that happened that had to happen that were a bit sad. For example, where we had 48, 47 brothers and one priest buried in that little cemetery. And one day <clears throat> we opened a new cemetery in Esopus. But these were the founding brothers. And even some of the men who are in the college teaching today who are here as brothers, they know that the last brother to be buried in that cemetery is Brother George Francis, head of the history department, who got his degree at Fordham and traveled back and forth mm. to continue. And he was a fantastic, his name was George Burns from Highland, mm. the last brother. The first brother to be buried from Our Lady Seat of Wisdom Chapel in 1953, the chapel was dedicated for December 
1953, to start the Marian year. It was in October, the brother. But here was a man who had driven his life here to this place, and the brothers remembered him very recent, besides all the old founders. And the cemetery was the tombstones were just closed in, and the wall, which was a four foot, four and a half foot wall, was filled in with sand, and all around, the whole thing was bulldozed, and, and <clears throat> where that memorial stone is, is about the site, but it was a much yeah. bigger site, naturally, where there were 48. Well, the brothers felt that uh, that should not have been done. You know? mm -hmm. It wasn't done, and it, it was done in a hurry, and it was, there was a, a lack of communication. It was only after that they found out things, so there was a lot of hurt in all this. <laughs> But time and the relations with the chap with the with the co co college now has healed a lot of wounds. Certainly, this summer there was a real sense during that convocation of uh, reaffirmation of our heritage and roots and of the brothers' uh, vital role. Uh, I cannot the commend the college and Dennis particularly enough because he went all out, and it was tremendous. The brothers, then, and there, there was a, a tremendous. Uh, surge all over the province, not just all the, when they went back, it changed the, com the complexion of everything, sure. the relationship. Yeah. And I have always stood by this college. We certainly have. I, I, I couldn't, I, I cannot deny that it has been the work of God from the beginning, you know, using people, using instruments, mm -hmm. but there were many miracles performed, you know. Yeah. Jack, I'd like to go back to that for a moment. Uh, in 1956, there were no paychecks attached to being on the lay advisory board, and <laughs> through the last 31 years, there hasn't been any paychecks for you. Uh, why have you stayed as actively involved uh, in Marist College? What was it that, in that early conversation with Brother Paul, that interested you in the project of this college, but has kept you involved for over 30 years? When I first met Paul, I had a tremendous admiration mm -hmm. for him, not just as an individual, but also what he was accomplishing. And uh, he was doing it in such a nice and smooth way, and he was helping the community here. Because mm -hmm. uh, his concept, when it was opened up to lay students and everything, was really to help the whole community here in Poughkeepsie. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was always very community-minded, and so was my father ahead of me. We were born and raised in Poughkeepsie, so was my father and like that. So that we appreciated what he was trying to do just for the community here. And I think that's one of the main reasons why I have uh, kept my interest in Marist College mm -hmm. is uh, that uh, everything I've done up here has been that. Going back to that period, you know, from 56 on, we'll say for a period of almost 10 years, the transition <clears throat> of changing this from a, a uh, almost like a religious affiliated college to like a non-sectarian college was very hard on the brothers. And just as Paul was mentioning, a lot of the brothers didn't like that. In fact, I often was suspicious that <clears throat> at one time we had inquiries after that from the Curia in the Vatican mm -hmm. <clears throat> on why the Marist brothers gave up their college in America, almost as if it was a mortal sin. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I collected a lot of the data together as the attorney for the <clears throat> college. and. I sent it to Paul, and uh, Paul took it to your mother house, I presume, uh, to the Curie, explaining what went on here in America and why the transition went from a religious college, just uh, teaching brothers, into a full-fledged lay college, in which the brothers could still go to, but I mean it was primarily a lay college. And I think one of the impetus that helped that along was the Monday money. <coughs> that came in the state of New York, <clears throat> which was a, back in the mid-60s, where money was granted to private colleges for giving the degree. You got X number of dollars for each degree that was conferred on a graduate, and X number of dollars for graduate degree, and like that. So that in the mid-60s, the brothers themselves decided that the best thing to do was to really change it over into a, with a lay board of trustees into a non-sectarian college. Uh, at that point, I think Harold Spencer was the first uh, 
a late trustee that was put on the board. And Brother Linus Richard, who later uh, took the Linus Richard Foy, which was his family name, um, was a president at that time. And gradually they added more and more lay people, and it became a predominantly lay board. Although it was always the intention, and has always been, and is true, we always have several brothers on that board. There's always mm -hmm. four or five or something like that. And in fact, we made a policy statement just at the time of the transition between Linus Foy and Dennis Murray on the structure of the board. So there would always be four or five representatives from the Marist Brothers on our board of trustees. And in fact, uh, after that transition occurred, the uh, Board of Regents, no, I think uh, rather than that, it was at the time that the first thought was of building dormitories here in the college. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the students, lay students that came here, came from various Marist high schools in Long Island and New York City and New Jersey, and they had no place to live. So the college had to start finding places to live. And they rented a number of rooms in the Nelson House and a number of rooms in Old King's Court on Cannon Street in Poughkeepsie. And <laughs> I can't believe I remember Paul Stokes is still dean of discipline. And he's going down to make a, a bed check at night. Wow. <laughs> and he had some surprises, you know. And, and uh, gosh, he used to get all excited about it. Students would be missing from their rooms and things like that. And he was a an old-time disciplinarian, mm -hmm. so, uh, <laughs> and he called me up as a, I was attorney, and he'd say, hey, what should I do? He says, if so-and-so wasn't in his room, you know, I don't know where he is, his parents will be after me. Uh, and um, so he said, well, wait a while and check it in the morning and see if he comes in. Of course, in the morning, he'd, he'd be back. So they thought the only way they could have real control of these students was to build a dormitory. At that time, the United States government set up a dormitory authority, and money could be borrowed at 3%. Remember? So we started with uh, Sheehan, was the first one. <laughs> then Leo became the second one. <clears throat> Nihilus Donnelly was given charge of hiring the architect and arranging everything on Sheehan. He hired an architect from Middletown to get his ideas, and he didn't like him, so he fired him. And um, Later on, he started a lawsuit against the college, uh, which we defended and, and succeeded because he really hadn't done any work on it. And then he hired another architect whose name I won't mention, and Nihilus had a conflict with him. Uh, he didn't like what he was doing, and, uh, but he had to go through with it because he'd been certified to the United States Dormitory Authority, and, and they had approved him. <coughs> so. He, in fact, that man is not an architect anymore. He left the business and went into something else. But the, uh, we finally got Sheehan up with all sorts of modifications that Nihilus put into it, which he thought was for the better, which I think it was myself. And it was probably at that time that I got interested in the building of grounds of the college, uh -huh. really, <laughs> because Nihilus had to call me all the time, and I'd go over and help me. He'd say, if I change this now, well, they renege on the money coming in. I had to call somebody in Washington and say, hey, we want to put a change in it. And the man that we kept calling had an Irish name, I've forgotten it, in Washington. And finally he said to me, hey, go on and get the building finished. Well, yeah, we don't care about what you do with it. And, and um, so we finally got it, she and finished. And that was the first dormitory. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten how many it holds over there, but if it was holding 100, we had 300 that wanted rooms on campus. So uh, immediately went to work on Leo. That dormitory was designed by Paul Canaan. In fact, Paul Canaan, the architect, who was a college architect for a long time. And I understand now Paul's living over in Spain. Uh, in, I don't know whether he's in semi-retirement or what. But, but in any event, uh, uh, Paul Canaan got a, an award from the Architectural Society for the design of Leo Dormitory Hall. The, uh, of course, there's not a, a lot of nihilists in that, too, because Paul Canaan was that type of an architect that if you had ideas and they were good and he, like, he changed his plans for it, uh, <coughs> Paul was very 
uh, receptive to any change of plans that, that might come along. And Nihilus had always had suggestions and ideas to change things. So that was put up as a second dormitory. Well, at that time, we had to convey property from the Marist brothers, who owned the whole campus here, mm -hmm. to the Marist College, which was an educational corporation by charter from the Board of Regents of State in New York. So uh, as attorney, I was given the job of preparing necessary deeds for the brothers to convey it to the college. And we had to have, at that time, uh, if my memory was correct, um, show to the dormitory authority <coughs> that they had the ability to uh, pay this loan. Because it was theoretically supposed to be self-sustaining, but then there had to be reserves set up. And I think today the college maintains a trust fund down in the Dutch's bank, uh, which is for repairs and restoration and improvements and like that mm -hmm. to the dormitories, which uh, are under loan from the United States Dormitory Authority. The uh, uh, after that, it was still a demand for more as the college kept growing because all of a sudden uh, we were growing at a very rapid rate. And by the mid-1960s, only like 10 years in existence, we had gone to like 1,600 students or something like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, of which eight or 900 wanted to be on campus. And they had facilities for like for 250 or 300. Uh, a little sideline uh, in relation to that. The old legal descriptions of this land was always, uh, in the old days, any form was described like west by the Hudson River, north by Smith, mm -hmm. east by Route 9, or Albany Post Road, it was always used to be called, and south by Waterworks Road or something like that. Well, Waterworks Road was put in by the city like in 1870 to the old filtering beds and, and the intake from the Hudson River they had for the water, water system for the whole city of Poughkeepsie. Well, the deeds that had come into those people and stayed there for several generations, like in McPherson Farm and later the Beck Farm, uh, they never mentioned anything about Waterworks Road. Uh -huh. So there was no way of knowing exactly what the descriptions were, whether they were good or the bad. And the college really couldn't afford, and the brothers couldn't afford to have a survey made, because that was a lot of money to make a survey in those days. So what we did, uh, we had one of the brother historians, who was, I think it was Brother Adrian, well, I'm not, I don't remember really, uh, that uh, gave me the old deed to draw for the southern side of the campus. We had to certify that the college owned it, and I had to certify personally to the United States Dormitory Authority, and, um, uh, which we did. <clears throat> so I just used the description he gave me, and we did it that way. Later on, the New York State Dormitory Authority was contacted, and they have a different legal procedure. They actually own the land upon which any building is built. So they wanted to put up Champagne Hall the, uh, the next dormitory was going to house around, I don't know, three or four hundred. So we certified that to a title company that that land was owned by the college and, and uh, we gave that section of it to the New York State Dormitory Authority. A very interesting thing is that a, a uh, history student here at the college, history major, decided for his senior thesis to, to uh, write the history of the college, the physical history of the college <clears> and everything. <throat> so after he did that, he came down to see me one day and he said, you know, Mr. Garland, he said, I'm a little puzzled by the description that was used in conveying the main campus from the Marist Brothers to the Marist College. And he said, I went way, way back into the 18th century, and he says, I think that the description of that property is what's north of Waterworks Road, not what is south of it. Hmm. So with that, I 
dug the whole thing out and I researched it myself personally and found out it was true. But just at that, the brothers at that time had built uh, Gregory and Bernard, and they owned that. The Sopas province uh, owned that on the north side of Waterworks Road. They wanted to convey that to the college because the college had guaranteed the mortgage that they put on there. So I said, fine. So I got out the other description that they had been deeded to the uh, to the Marys Brothers like in 1904 or sometime like that, which actually the one I used then was, I let the other one go that was north of it, and I used the one that was south of Waterworks Road. So that corrected the mistake I, that had been made about eight or nine years earlier. So that history student was correct in, in uh, discovering the mistake. So we had it corrected, and then that uh, okayed everything that we had certified to the United States Dormitory Authority and to the New York State Dormitory Authority wow. on it. See, but it's had, a, it, had it been not been for um, the labor the brothers could not have had funds from these different government authorities That's because right. of the separation of church and state and so on. Mm -hmm. But when the, the brothers signed over to the Board of Trustees, the reason for the little flack or the little trouble that they had was any religious order like ours is considered working for the church, that we belong to the church. Mm -hmm. And anything we have belongs to the, to the Catholic Church. And a brother, in signing this over, was accused of alienation of church property uh -huh. you know, yeah. without permission. So this was, uh, we, we had failed to clear in Rome before, you know. Well, I'm very familiar with alienation of church property. You know, when we bought Eden Terrace, we had to wait to get an approval from Rome to buy the house from the Maris Brothers. <laughs> this is what it is. I know all about There was alienation. no problem with the college except that they had done it without clearing it first, uh -huh. you know, and that's where the flag was. Jack, you've been involved in every major <clears throat> building project on this campus now for more than a generation. Uh, what concepts uh, have motivated you? What ideas have you had behind that driving impetus to build new buildings, develop, renovate, uh, beautify the campus? Well, I think going back, uh, the dormitory authorities were, I mean, the dormitories that were built, rather, were forced on us by the students wanting a place to live. So that was easy enough to do. Mm -hmm. When McCann Foundation was started in 1969, and we started to do uh, projects for that, like building the golf course in the city and rebuilding St. Mary's Church, putting McCann Ice Arena in with the uh, Civic Center downtown Poughkeepsie, one of the next concepts that we had or in, in, for a project to do was a indoor swimming pool that would be available to the community. Well, Linus Foy and I sat down many times and discussed the future of Marist College. <clears throat> and one of the ideas that we had was that, uh, and of course we had lady students at that time, or girl students, and I, I want to go back on that because that was an interesting concept we had or time that we had in debating that one over. But one of the concepts that Linus and I came up with was that in order to attract students, we had to have good recreational facilities here. <clears throat> Lee Needle Field, as an example, was built with that concept. We purchased the land from New York State, or New York Central Railroad, and then filled it in by waste material that New York State had when they built the uh, north-south arterial in the city of Poughkeepsie. Hmm. <clears throat> and that whole practice field south of there was all filled in and, and built on that seven acres that we purchased from New York Central Railroad and the field we got and, uh, and then covered up. We put drains in there. We did everything possible in order to try and make that facility available with softball diamonds and a practice field and different things like that. But that wasn't enough. We had to have indoor facilities. And the old gym 
which is now Marion Hall, was really not sufficient to take care of the increase in students mm -hmm. that were coming in here. So the idea was there ought to be a field house. That was Linus's idea. And my idea was that we needed a swimming pool so, and available for the community. So we combined the two together. And McCann then agreed to finance a lot of it. Some was financed by the college through a mortgage, which had been paid off in the meantime, um, to make that available for the students in a, a, uh, a, a multi-purpose type of building, an auditorium that would be used for basketball and track and convocations and meetings, graduations and like that, along with the swimming pool that we made available so that it could be changed over to metric system. It's 25 yards and 25 meters, so we would have a movable bulkhead to go back and uh -huh. forth and on. At that time, we built it, which is just 10 years ago, it opened up in, uh, I think it was uh, April, April 1976. Uh, everybody, everybody here in America was gun ho about the metric system. Mm -hmm. It seems I've fallen by the wayside <laughs> in the meantime. But uh, that's why we have a movable bulkhead. And that was conceived by Linus and myself when we were sitting down and trying to decide on this. And we thought that was the easiest way to do it. And we contacted Paddock Pool Company and uh, they researched it out and they came up with this idea of a movable bulkhead that it could be moved back and forth. And oddly enough, after that, I think uh, Fordham University copied that and, mm -hmm. and several other colleges in the east of built pools copied that. Uh, in any event, uh, I think it's proven true that in having that recreational facility, indoor facility, and the usage that it gets, uh, what I haven't heard recently, but I remember four or five years ago, they said there was a, like a, more than a half a million people were you know, uh, using it all the time. A lot of repeats, naturally. And, but um, the students use it to the tune of at least a half a million uh, per year. In any event, uh, we thought that would be the, the uh, hub of helping to increase enrollment. And I think it has. Mm -hmm because the enrollment has certainly increased every single year, and I think one of the sales things is that. The other idea also to help enrollment, the concept of students going to college today is different from when I went, when everybody was in a dormitory, because I went to a Jesuit college, and they had a prefect there, and you had to be in at a certain hour, and in bed at a certain time, and things like that. But the dormitory life has changed, and students like something a little bit different. That was one concept we had, but also, in the event enrollment ever went down, mm -hmm. we thought places like the townhouses, as an example, uh, would then become available that the college could lease out to faculty or to the public or some other way. And, but it's proven to be very attractive for students to live that way. They seem to enjoy living in sure. townhouse style rather than the old dormitory style. And the same concept we had in relation to the apartments and the north end of the campus. That idea was the same, except we made it into apartments rather than townhouses. Uh, but those type of apartments up there could be converted to townhouses if, if needed. But that, again, was the same idea. Also, the athletic fields that are built on the west of the apartments towards the river. That was very rough land down there. In fact, uh, McCann Foundation has spent over a million dollars in purchasing that and fixing it up mm -hmm. and getting it ready. And the concept there was to help the female students have an outdoor recreational uh, facility, which uh, they didn't have because the male students were dominating Lee Needoff Field and the practice field down there. And it was a very little spot for the female students. So the concept was, well, have it available there, and they can spread it out so that mm -hmm. the female students can have. Uh, you certainly were a driving force in those trustee discussions about the need for athletic facilities for women on the campus. From what I understand, you were deeply immersed in those discussions about women coming to Marist College. So maybe you could take us back to the 
late 1960s when that issue was being debated, whether this all-male uh, college uh, should allow women students to come. Well, certainly the original concept Paul had was an all-male college. That's right. And, uh, <laughs> and all the, we had commuter students, and originally I think it was all to be, only to be commuter students. And then with all the students that wanted to come here and live on campus, we had to go into dormitories. And the brothers, while they were in charge of it, never had any idea of having any female students here. But when our, when the change, the transition came to transfer the college over with a lay board of trustees, or predominantly a lay board, uh, Dr. John Schroeder, who was in charge of the night school at the college here, uh, came to the advisory board first that was still in existence and uh, said he wanted to take in some female students. So at a lot of debate, the idea was, okay, we'll take them in for the evening, but not in the daytime. <laughs> so they were first allowed into taking uh, night classes. And the enrollment of female students started to increase rapidly, mm -hmm. very rapidly at night. So then the transition period took place. So then the regular board of trustees had the, had it, uh, should they allow female students in the day, day school? Mm -hmm. <laughs> In hindsight, I think I was wrong, because I was one of those who thought, no, it should remain an all-male college. Because I went to an all-male college, and I sort of enjoyed it. And uh, I had a couple of my daughters went to an all-female college, and a couple of my, some of my sons went to an all-male college, like Holy Cross, mm -hmm. Fairfield, and like that. But then I began to see the Jesuits were allowing uh, most of their colleges to go co-ed, and I was very close to a lot of Jesuits, and I spoke to a lot of them in relation to it. And they thought that for the future survival of a private college, it had to go co-ed. Uh -huh. And if it didn't, they didn't think the either all female or all male could last very long uh -huh. um, as a private institution because the expense of it was going up and the uh, scholarships and all should be opened up to females as well as males and all. So after, I don't know how long we debated it, but it was a long time, maybe I say six months, nine months, something like that. And finally we said, we took a vote. The vote was pretty close. But the, to allow to go co-ed went out. And so finally opened the doors then to female students. Uh -huh. And I think now it's more than 50% Female? 51%. 51% uh, in the college here. One quarter of our alumni association are women, so uh, it's been a dramatic change. Well, I don't think we regretted it uh -huh. under any circumstances. No, in no, fact, no, I think no. it's been a very big plus. But the transition during that time is uh, always debatable. And I suppose it's because of tradition, really, uh, uh, that causes that. I know a lot of the Feminists uh, would uh, <coughs> criticize all the males who were not 100% in favor of it or something like that. But uh, um, uh, I think the, the beauty of it is that we've been able to accept it mm -hmm. and then try to change our physical plan and make it available so that the female student has just as much rights and opportunities as the male student. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is... Uh, been a real plus then for the college and particularly for increased enrollment. When you refer to the all male and all female, I remember the only two colleges in Poughkeepsie at the time were Vassar and Marist. That's so right. when we had meetings in Albany in any <coughs> academic procession, I was always booked to walk along with the president of, of Vassar College. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, let me, uh, let's take a, a broad look back. I, I'm sure there's uh, been a lot of serious moments in the last uh, 40 years of this institution, but there's probably been some funny moments uh, along the way. You've got a funny story to tell us, Paul, from the early days, and Jack, I'll ask you to maybe recount a, a funny incident or two along the way. 
Anything that kind of sticks out there as a, a time that really made you chuckle and laugh? Well, uh, this is not a chuckle, but it's an admiration. And I'm happy to say this. Because of the, the nature in which the, the, the college developed, you see, it started as, and I'm very proud of this uh, incident. And I'm referring to Dr. Schroeder. Mm -hmm. Dr. Schroeder <clears throat> was the first layman employed here full time. And um, he's a wonderful person. He was head of the English department at Arlington, Arlington High School. I thought it was Oakwood School. No? He was a Quaker, wasn't he? He is a Quaker. He is a Quaker. That was but he was a teaching Arlington, head of English Arlington, department Arlington. at Arlington High School. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he, I checked back his credential. He had a doctorate in education and a doctorate in English. I went to see the man and I asked him. I explained to him what we're going to do. We're getting in on the ground floor. We're starting a young college. And you know, when, when Albany told me to get laid Board of Trustees, I went to you. And they said, well, they said, you need some lay teachers. Well, I mean, doctors. I got some of the brothers, but I needed more. So I went to see Dr. Short and I said, you have two degrees that I'm interested in. I explained that we're starting the. And he said, sir, I would be very very much interested in this, getting in on the ground floor of a young college. I said, but there are a few drawbacks. I said, I cannot pay you the salary that you're getting now. He, he, was, he was head of the department of the English department. I said, this is what I'm able to afford to give to you now, but the college will grow and the salary will grow and everything will grow with time. He said, well, if it's a young college just starting out, I would very much like to be associated with it. And it's not a matter of salary. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I appreciate that because it, then it means it's a matter of dedication. He said, yes. And everything was wonderful. He had agreed to come and we drew up the contract and one day, we were waiting for him to you know, finalize the contract. He had the copy. We were down in what is now the library. That is the brother's dining room. <clears throat> and the, one of the brothers told me, uh, Brother Master, there's a gentleman out there waiting, calling to like to see you. So I came up to where the chapel is. And it was Dr. Schroeder and the other contract. He said, Brother, I'm ready to sign this. But he said, uh, I have some obligation to fulfill. I said, what's the matter, doctor? Is, is the contract unsatisfactory? Oh, no, very, very satisfactory. But he said, there's something that bothers me that I must tell you. I said, well, what is it? He said, uh, I, I look forward to coming here. I know it's a Catholic call. I know it's all brothers. But he says, I don't know if you know that I am not a Catholic. Hmm. I said, I, it never entered into my mind. I said, I know, we're, all, we're, we're hiring you for your doctorate, doctor, not for your religion. He said, uh, I am a Quaker. I said, doctor, answer me one question. Would you say that you're a good Quaker? He said, well, I try to be. I said, that's all that matters. <laughs> so we hired him. Uh -huh. And uh, from that moment on, we never questioned a person's religion. In what started out as an all-religious college, we never questioned the person's religion, you know, but his qualifications. And I think that the, uh, I give credit to Dr. Schroeder, willing to come to accept a lesser salary to get in on the ground floor. That man has worked very hard for the college. In yes, charge, as Jack said, of the night school, evening school, he was awarded an honorary degree. He's retired. And I'd like to say that I keep in touch with him. Oh, he, lives, nice. he lives in, in Venice, <coughs> Florida in the winters, and back, at, back up here in Pleasant Valley in the summer. And in the winter, I go to Florida and I visit him, stay over. And he would have come, but he's authoritative. He would have come to our convocation. I invite him for June 6th, mm -hmm. but he cannot, he cannot travel too much mm -hmm. because of his legs. But he's a great person. You know. great. In 1967, <clears throat> uh, 
was the first presidential award that was given to anybody at a breakfast like they have every year. And Dr. John Schroeder and myself were the first recipients huh. of that. I remember that very well. Hmm. Uh, and it came as a surprise to both of us. Uh, I was very friendly with uh, John Schroeder. And when we went to that breakfast that morning, the two of us were sitting there together, and we were kidding about some of the things that were happening on, on, on campus here and uh, at the college and all. And we weren't paying any attention to what was going on. And all of a sudden, uh, I hear his name called out. And I said, hey, John. I said, they just called your name out like that. And he looked up, you know, neither one was paying any attention. And on his voice sitting up here, and he got a scowl on. <laughs> he already asked Dr. Schroeder to come up for his award. And we were just talking, you know, wasn't paying any attention. So, so because I always butted in, and I said, and there were a couple hundred men there you know, at the breakfast and all, and I said, what'd you say, Linus? And he said, I asked Dr. Schroeder to come up here. <laughs> so he went up and they got the award, and then next they gave me one. So we were a little embarrassed that day, uh, not paying attention to what was going on. You talk about a, humor, a humorous incident. Uh, I was chairing the Board of Trustees in 1973, mm -hmm. and at the graduation, that was 72 to 73, and the graduation in 73, um, it was in the afternoon, and it was in leaning off field, and the podium was always on the east side, so that the afternoon sun, you know, came right into your face, and the students were out there in front of you. <clears throat> so it was in the afternoon, so I went down and played golf that morning, and. At lunch, I guess I had a couple of beers and a good-sized lunch, and they come up here like at 2 o'clock or so for the graduation. And while it was going on, and they snapped some pictures, unfortunately, I had dozed off. And, I, and my picture there, you can see me almost sound asleep. The following year, Malcolm Wilson was governor of the state at that time, and he was coming down here for to get an honorary degree and to be the commencement speaker. And there had been a man that was in the Hudson River State Hospital who had sent threatening letters to Malcolm Wilson. And he had been let out. And they were trying to recapture him, and they, they couldn't. And that morning at graduation, again, it was in the same thing. It was a hot sun that day. And I played golf that morning and come up here like that. But that morning, up in the parking lot at St. Francis Hospital, <clears throat> they found a a uh, van up there, <clears throat> and it was full of guns and, and a lot of different kinds of weapons and everything like that. So the BCI, the state troopers, uh, uh, did they come down here and drove to look over the captured stuff that was up there in the hospital grounds, and they figured out that that may have been up there in order to make a threat on Malcolm Wilson's life. So in the processional coming down, they must have had about 10 state troopers that <coughs> pardon me, were dressed up in cap and gown that sat in among the students. <coughs> and there were a couple up on the podium with us. Hmm. So Malcolm Wilson and I are just sitting here like this, and we're chatting and all. And uh, this fellow behind me taps me on the shoulder. And he said, Mr. Garland, would you mind moving a little bit to the left? He says, you're in my line of fire. <laughs> and I must say, boy, I didn't doze that day at all. <laughs> we've, had, uh, we've had sitting here on the, the table here um, a plaque. And uh, Brother Paul, I'm going to ask you to uh, give a little bit of background about what this award is after I mention it and to talk about why Jack uh, received it. It says, the congregation of the Marist Brothers of the school, wishing to express gratitude appreciation and for the devoted service to the Marist Brothers and to the community of Marist College. For that purpose, on a general session of their congregation, made Mr. John Gartland, Jr., an affiliated member of the Marist Brothers congregation. These kinds of awards given out often, and what's the significance of... Uh... Now, this dates from way back in the beginning of the order, when we, you know, we, sometimes we have a hard time to manage. We need, we need help. We had the help of doctors or lawyers or financiers and so on. And uh, where a person has been exceptionally helpful, not only by his contributions, mm -hmm. but by his loyalty and his dedication 
to what we stand for, you know, not for an individual project or this, we're putting up this so we want help for a situation, but consistently dedicated and loyal to what we stand for mm -hmm. and uh, not ashamed of it and willing to, and he's a man who's after our founder doing good quietly, who's not looking for that type of award, uh -huh. you know. Uh, we allow the individual provinces, like the United States is a province or two provinces, they can give a little local award to an individual in recognition of what he has done. But a man who has done exceptionally, who's been proven exceptionally loyal to the, the order from headquarters decides to affiliate him. The affiliation includes his wife and his family. And we are obligated to daily and for his, the duration of his life to keep his family and his intentions in our prayers. And this, this, this list is all over the globe. Hmm. Since the beginning of the order, the beginning of the order in 1817, which is now spread in 72 countries, in 846 schools and so on, it's widespread, <coughs> there has been, you know, one or two or three a year. Mm -hmm. We have a total right now, I believe, of 406 affiliated members all over the world gives them a right to come into our mother house at any time and to, and to visit, to stay there and so on. It, uh, it's an entry card into any Marist house besides the assurance of prayers for the duration of his, his life for our family. And Jack uh, d highly deserved this because I, I'd like to say something which is maybe out of water, but uh, I'm saying it anyway. When I went to get Jack for member of the Board of Trustees, because I needed him, we needed him. But I knew of his loyalty to the brothers, of his work with the brothers. I knew his work as a lawyer. I knew that he had been in our school. And there was no question at that time, Jack had absolutely nothing to do at that time with the McCann Foundation. So we were not going after the Jack because of the, <laughs> of, of the McCann Foundation. We, we went because of what Jack had to offer. Mm -hmm. In his own quiet, simple way, he's a man who does a lot of good quietly. Very few people know the extent of the good that he does. He is living his life according to the spirit that our founder gave us. We cherish that. We appreciate his dedication to us, to our cause, to furthering that. And not only it is well deserved, it's, it's one of the few in this country that's well deserved. And I am glad to say this publicly, because yeah. he has it coming to him. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. One of the, you asked for an interesting, or it's not a, a humorous, but for example, when we put up this Seat of Wisdom Chapel, the Seat of Wisdom Chapel was put up in 1953. It was supposed to be dedicated for the Marian year. And all through the church, they celebrated the Marian year, dedication to Our Lady. <clears throat> and we decided that our chapel would be ready for the Marian year, which started on December 8th, Feast of the Immaculate Conception, 1953. Our chapel was ready for that, you know. And uh, we, this chapel, and I say this with pride, that Nyla's design that we talked over and so on is octagonal. Right. It was the first chapel or church ever built with the altar in the center mm -hmm. and the, the, the <coughs> faithful around it. And when Cardinal Spellman came to dedicate it in May of 1953, he was up there pontificating in the chapel, and he grabbed my hand and he said, Paul, this is the church of the future. Hmm. You know? well, that was a he was right. privilege. I mean, that was a, a, a compliment that he made. But what the, what I, the story that I want to tell is that the beams of this chapel, which are maybe 36 feet long, all laminated 
the, the two by six is laminated ten deep. This was all made in, on the west coast in Oregon. And this was brought here by freight trains. Hmm. And it was delivered behind the Dusso chemical. Remember Dusso oh, yes, chemical sorry. landing across Route 9 and back of Western, <laughs> there's a, a railroad landing, and those low bottom flat cars with all these beams around there. And Nihilus had a crane, and he came up with this crane, and how in the world is he going to grab a beam and go all the way down you know, and bring this thing over to put him in place? And this was an old used crane, too. Yes, and uh, I had not too much confidence in the crane, frankly. I said, Nihilus, forget it. I said, I have a solution. I gave him 32 or 36 brothers. <laughs> All the, I says, you go, and I forget how many beams there are, maybe 10. I said, you go and see how many brothers you need to lift one of those beams and carry it. The brothers carried, were going to, they, he said he needed 32 or 36 or whatever the number. I, I chose all the Huskies to go over with Nihilus, and they came, and I stood in my cassock, and Route 9 stopped all the traffic both ways and let the brothers pass. Wow. They carried the beam over to the building site. Then we resumed the traffic. We did that for every one of the oh, beams. No. <laughs> we did, didn't need a truck. We didn't need a, uh, a hoist or anything. <laughs> Listen, in our, our closing few minutes, uh, we've spent a lot of time today talking about uh, the history. But Marist College is not only rich in its history, it's also rich in its promise for the future. Uh, what, uh, what must Marist College do to remain a vibrant, strong institution as it looks forward to the 21st century? I'd like both of you to maybe dream a little bit. I think it's on the right track that with this communication center that we're in. Mm -hmm. This is something terrific. And it has, it has gone gung-ho for computers, which is what the people need today. And I'm very proud of what we are offering. I have a concern. I expressed it, and I repeat it. Your Use of this Whitman building, or what do you call the Western Marist train. East? Marist East, East, yes. That bothers me. Bothers me, too. There may never be an accident on Route 9, but this is a main artery, <clears throat> and I feel that if there should be one, it would be almost unforgivable, you know? I am looking forward to the day when we have a building, a classroom building, our academic building, on this side of the road. I look forward to that, you know. Well, that's I in the works, Paul. Hmm? That is in the works, you know. Well, it, I don't even know or not, but we, uh, uh, as you know, or may have seen, rather, that big rock pile that's out there. <clears throat> well, the architect that designed this building, we asked him to look at that site out there as a possible new classroom building so we can bring all the students back over on this side of Route 9. Tremendous. And he said the first thing we have to get rid of that rock pile and bring it down to a level. So this past winter, we were able to get a company give us a good figure on, on uh, blasting it all so it's all loose. However, we do not have permission from the town under their zoning laws to get it down, but we have an application out there right now so they will give us permission <coughs> to get rid of all that rock. What we are going to do is uh, we're going to bring in a portable a rock crusher <clears throat> will crush up all that rock into little pieces sure. and use that as a bed for the various roads that will be built on campus to tie in the north end and the south end, really, to make it uh, so that students don't have to drive out on Route 9 and go around. They'll be able to do things on campus here. We're going back to our roots because we used to have a crusher on campus here because there's a lot of <clears throat> granite and shale, and we used it to fill yeah. it up. And once we do that, we also have plans uh, being designed by the architect for a uh, possible classroom building. And incidentally, uh, Jack Newman, now one of our trustees, is heading up a capital campaign, <clears throat> which hopefully will be used to raise funds for the 
but there's no classroom building. I know Tony can tell more about that because that's under his jurisdiction here at the college. And uh, <clears throat> I do think that would be a big plus. Right. It's, well, it's definitely, Paul, uh, a major concern of, uh, of the trustees, and there's a solid commitment on our part to, uh, to try to make that new classroom building happen. Another concern... Within three years. Well, I'm, I'm happy, very happy to hear that. Because so when you get this, back from Africa, you'll have a new classroom this, building. This, to look this at. would please me very much, because I believe that the college will grow more, but I hope it won't grow too much. I think it's good to keep it as a small college. I, mean, I don't know what your enrollment level. Just about three thousand. Yes, well, well, you might go to five, but I wouldn't go beyond five if if you have to. I, 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 like, I would like it to keep as a small college, but exclusive. Is what, about 3,000 uh, full-time equivalents? Yes. And about 3,600 bodies all together, is that about that's right? right? That's about right. So, because uh, there are part-time students, and that's why uh, that happens on it. But one of the, <clears throat> another thing that we've got vision to do is to put in what we call a Maris Village, which will be a little commercial venture uh, on Route 9, where the bank, Dutch's Bank building is mm -hmm. now, and to the east of the apartments, and we'll take in south to the, where the gas station is there. We hope to eliminate the gas station and build this in there whereby the college bookstore, as an example, can be moved in one of those buildings. And then there'll be maybe a convenience uh, store, which will be to benefit to the students here. There might be a, a fast food place, we don't know yet. But then there'd be perhaps a maybe a barber shop, maybe a laundromat, and things like that. Which they need. That would be available to the public, but also be available for the students. And the students really need that. And I think it would be a, a big plus. <clears throat> plus, it would produce a little revenue for the college. And uh, but the main thrust of it is it would be for the convenience of the students, because we have. What do we got? Almost 2,000 on campus, uh, resident students on campus. Right. You have 2,000 students plus the faculty here. Uh, that's a big drawing group right there for that. So I think uh, <clears throat> in relation to the future plans, uh, we will have then a master plan for the whole college, which the architect is now designing, which will show where the roads will be and where everything will be. And we still have room for two more townhouses on this side of that big parking lot out there, just to the west here of this Lowell Thomas building. And we probably also have, there are probably not too many more places on campus for, for dormitories or for apartments or townhouses or like that. But uh, we're gonna to try to keep it at around the 3,000 level. I don't think we wanna to go to 5,000. But I, I, I would hate to see it go to 5,000 or over. I think it should be kept rather small. Yeah, I, and, I think that's, and, and, I think and, that's and, our sense. And stress sense. The, the efficiency, the, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 its worth, its quality, mm -hmm. you know? When uh, this interview started uh, an hour and a half ago, uh, we asked Brother Paul about what was his inspiration uh, to become a Marist brother. And he recalled uh, the concept of mission, that the Marist brothers were sent on mission. It may surprise uh, those of you who will watch this interview uh, to find out that uh, this concern for mission is still a driving force in Brother Paul's life. In fact, on his birthday, August 28th this year, Brother Paul will leave the United States to go to work in one of the developing nations of the world, Liberia, to help a new church, a developing church in that country, to grow and to become strong. Paul, can you give us just a few words about that uh, impending <coughs> mission and responsibility? I've always wanted to be a missionary. Right. And uh, when I asked to go out here, when I, when I took my vows, I asked to, because we take three, four vows, the, the, the normal three, and then the, some take the vow of stability, the vow never to leave the order, which I took. And uh, when I was commissioned to get this college organized, I work from 1943 to 46 to get it. The, ch the college charter was given to us in 46. I took the vow never to leave the order in 46, and I asked then to go. I said, now that you got what you asked of me, let me go to the missions. Mm -hmm. He says, you're not finished. There's a lot more work. You've got to stay here. <laughs> so I stayed here. 
And I asked repeatedly to go to the missions. As irony would have it, I went to Rome for 18 years to work for my order and the Vatican, and I held the Vatican diplomatic passport, did some work for them, and I, I visited missions all over the world, mm -hmm. you know, traveled all over the world. I traveled eight months out of every year for 18 years and visited missions. So I know missions, and I've been attracted to missions. And the last convocation which we had because of the brothers, August 15th, that you referred to, the bishop where we, the brothers are going, we decided that to thank the Lord for his 100 years of service in the United States, we'd open a, a mission in a poor country for poor boys, poor students. And we, we, we sent a team to investigate. They decided on Liberia. I had nothing to do with it. And they went there, and the bishop had only four or five priests. And the brothers opened the school, which is going to be 12 classes, eight elementary and four high school. We sent three brothers. Another one went in February. I told them then, at that time, I'd be willing to go. So they looked at me rather strangely. And my buddy, Brother Norbert, my age, my group, said the same thing. At the convocation that year, we all had with us, the two of us, we had a white cassock ready in case we were, <laughs> we, they, we, they finally accepted. They thought we were kidding. The bishop heard that I was anxious to come. He came and he pleaded with me to accept to go there as administrator of his diocese. He only has four priests. And the priest who was being administrator of his diocese was also in charge of the seminary. And it was too much work. I told him, Bishop, if my superiors allow me to go, I will go gladly, but not before September 87, because I'm committed to this present job until the end of June. So he asked the superiors if I'd come. The superiors asked me, I said, well, you asked me to go to India, and I was willing to go, but you can't get into India. They don't want any more missionaries. In Pakistan, I started, they asked me to come. I said, I'll go Pakistan, I'll go to Liberia, whatever you want, but I'll go at any time. And I am very, very happy that I was, uh, Brother Charles Howard, the superior, said, well, the brothers are just starting in Liberia. We'd like you to go there and help out because you can, you're an older person, and Brother Norbert is of my age is also there. The, the young men that are trained there, I've had them here in training in Poughkeepsie. I've trained all of them, and they asked me to come, so I'm going with, with a thrill. I'm anxious to go. It's poor. There's no electricity. We boil the water. We have to travel 350 miles for the nearest post office, bank, or shopping center. And we need a Jeep for mud, because it's a muddy road. But here is a challenge to me. I say this in all humility, I believe I am a GTD man. They put me in this job here to get things done, and I, I'm a mover, you know? And, and this is a challenge. But this is, for me, reverse discrimination. Mm -hmm. Here is a person who had a significant job in his order, going to be the secretary of a young black bishop. This is a tremendous tribute that the church wants to <clears throat> manifest to the black people of Africa, you know? <laughs> I am willing to do this. I have been psyching myself to keep the brakes on, you know, to, to be a John the Baptist where he must increase, I must decrease. I've got to act in the background, advise him quietly, not to put him on the spot. So it's a tremendous personal challenge to me that I am facing very happy to do so. I've spent this whole year contacting foundations. I've already picked up about you no know, money for uh, the furniture of the school and money for one generator. I have to get money for another generator. I have a, com a foundation in session on the 15th of May to answer me if they will furnish me with a Jeep. I have a Lee, uh, Lee Iacocca letter that he's de studying to find out whether he can help me. So you see, I'm, I'm way back in 1943, all over again, again, at 74 years of age. It's marvelous. And the, 
I am very grateful that the Lord is giving me this challenge. Yeah, and so are we. I accepted for three years because in 1990, I'll celebrate 60 years as a Maris brother. I will come back to celebrate with my buddies. But if my health is still good, if I am a help and not a hindrance, I'll go back there. If I cannot go back, I'll retire here at Maris College in that building that you're going to put up. OK. We'll have room here for you, Paul. <laughs> As you can see, uh, the reason why Marist College is the vibrant, growing institution that it is is because of these two GTD men, men who have gotten things done here at Marist College and are continuing to get things done. Jack and Paul, thank you for what's been an inspiring moment for me. Thanks. Thank you.